Gospel according to St. John, the 14th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, so that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way to the place where I am going. And Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you know me, you will know my Father also. And from now on, you do know him, and you have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and we will be satisfied. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you all this time, Philip, and you still do not know me? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you I do not speak on my own, but the Father who dwells in me does his work. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. But if you do not, then believe me because of the works themselves. Truly I tell you, the one who believes in me will also do the works that I do, and in fact, will do greater works than these, because I am going to the Father. I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If in my name you ask me for anything, I will do it. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. You may be seated. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. John's Gospel is um, quite different than the other three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Um, John seems more of a theologian than he does someone who's writing a story about Jesus, though he technically was not writing a theology book. He was just telling of Jesus in a different way, with a different approach than the other three were. John has what's called a very high Christology, uh, a very highly elevated idea of who Jesus is and was. Um, more often in John's Gospel than in the others, Jesus is, in some ways, indirectly claiming to be God. There are the I am statements in John's Gospel. There's seven of them. This is one of them. I am the way, the truth, and the life. When God first introduced himself to Moses, or when Moses encountered God at the burning bush, and he said, who should I tell the people who you are? Like, who is sending me to, to liberate the people from Egyptian slavery? And God said, tell them I am sent you. That is a direct uh, a claim by Jesus to be God. And in his writing and the way he wrote, incredibly eloquent, very elevated uh, language. Uh, it can also be very confusing. That's not surprising. If you're familiar at all and have read and spent enough time in Scripture, especially reading the Gospels, Jesus didn't always make things perfectly clear. There was quite a bit of opaqueness to what Jesus said, and that's quite intentional. I mean, I, because Lindy and I have been watching the, the streaming show, The Chosen, I keep referencing that because I dig that show, and I see things on there, and I'm like, yeah, that's totally right. Uh, they were getting ready for the last episode we watched. Jesus was preparing for the Sermon on the Mount, a very lengthy sermon he gave, and in Matthew's Gospel, it's the first really big public sermon that he gave to a large group of people. And in the show, they have Matthew, like, as his secretary, writing down the things that Jesus is preparing for. And I was uh, happy to see Jesus was nervous about his sermon. 
He was thinking about the things that he wanted to say and having them written down rather than just getting up and talking um, and preparing for that. But it, at the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, uh, the way that he had it written initially was, uh, um, you are salt, you are the salt of the earth. And he goes on to explain this and that, and, and Matthew's like, I'm not sure you want to start with that. <laughs> People might not quite understand what you're saying, and Jesus is like, yeah, I see where you're coming from. So, yeah, I'll go and I'll, let me think about that. Then he comes back with the Beatitudes, that blessed are the poor, blessed are the meek, blessed are those who mourn, etc., etc. And Matthew's still confused. He's like, I, I don't get it. And Jesus kind of interprets what he's going to say, and it's much more clear. And Matthew goes, why don't you just say it that way? <laughs> well, Matthew, I want people to think. I want them to think about what it is that I'm saying and not just say it super plainly. And so there is a vagueness to what's written in the Gospels. And again, I think that is an intentional thing. I'm a person, and maybe you're the same way, that likes things to be in black and white, likes things to be super clear. Just tell me what to do, and I'll do it, and we're good, right? Don't make me think about or interpret what it is that you're trying to say to me. And in the chapter 14 of, of John's Gospel, this is, just, this is just after Jesus has washed his disciples' feet at the Passover feast. This is the eve that he is going to be arrested, betrayed and arrested, um, betrayed by Judas and arrested by the Romans with the the uh, Jewish police, and he's aware of what's going to take place. He knows that he's going to be taken away from his disciples, and he's already told them he's going to die, all kinds of confusion with that. But at this point, he is preparing them. He is being the pastor, Jesus, and trying to offer some comfort to them because he knows that what's going to happen is going to be incredibly, incredibly heartbreaking for his followers to see. They've been with him for three years, and their expectations are obviously quite different than what's going to take place, even after the three years. And so Jesus is offering them some assurances. In my Father's house, there are many rooms, many mansions, depends on how you translate that uh, Greek word, but there's places, and I'm, I'm going to prepare a place for you. But if I go to prepare a place for you, I, I'm also going to come back and take you to where I am. And you know where I'm going. You know the way. What? Thomas says, I, we, don't know, we don't know where you're going. We have no idea where you're going to. Just what are you trying to say? And he says something that is quoted quite often. He's put on t-shirts and bumper stickers. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And how we interpret that, I have the slightest idea. I've come to really embrace the I don't know answer. <laughs> I really have. Something I didn't think I would ever embrace early in my education and certainly early in my career as a pastor because, well, you all expect me to know all the answers. When you, before entering into seminary, I was told by a number of people that or warned by a number of people, uh, a lot of things I was warned about, uh, but in particular for this moment, uh, be prepared to have your theology, your understanding of God completely disassembled and then reassembled and then completely disassembled again and then reassembled and repeat and repeat and repeat and repeat. And, and what did that mean? At the time I was like, I have no idea what that meant. Uh, I discovered fairly quickly as I started taking classes and started learning and reading these books, like all of the things that I thought I knew to be sure about God and the ways of God and what it meant to be a follower of God, I was sure of many things. And then as we would sit and discuss certain things, and it was all based on scripture and sermons that I had heard from pastors that I had listened to um, uh, and other people and, you know, basically common culture and some of the bumper sticker sort of things like Jesus only helps those who help themselves and by the way that's not in scripture anywhere he never said that nor did anybody else 
Um, but it's something that if you ask them, many Christians, if that's true, they, many of them, I'm sure more than probably should, would say, yeah, that seems right. It's just the way that we are wired as human beings. We try to create God in our image. I've said this a number of times. It's just our nature. It's what sin does to us. It, it compels us to put ourselves in the place of God, and then we want some comfort in the black and white of knowing this is who God is. We put God in the box. And then when we do that, a professor would say, well, if this is the case, then, then this is also the case. This is the way you know, things are supposed to be. To give you a fairly graphic and really uncomfortable statement, it's like, well, everything happens for a reason, like God's behind everything that happens. Well, when a child get, gets raped, is that happening for a reason? And when I heard that for the first time, I was like, oh man, <laughs> no. That's not what God had intended. God doesn't direct and make everything happen in our world. Sin is the greatest influence in our world, and God allows it to happen. But anyways, without getting too theological, that's just one of many examples where my theology was completely disassembled and reassembled. And I began to understand that the more I learned and was taught about who God was, the less and less I began to know and understand that as I learned more, God got bigger in my world, in my mind, and in my heart, and the bigger God got, the less able I was to understand the ways of God. God doesn't ask us or demand of us to know. And that passage, after Thomas said, I don't know where you're going, and Philip says, show us the Father. Jesus repeatedly in that passage says, believe, believe in me, believe the things that I say to you, trust in me, I will do this and I will do this, believe, you don't have to know, you just have to believe and have faith in the things that I have said and I have taught you. We overcomplicate things, we want to make the rules. We love rules. I love rules. I hate rule breakers. The people that drive in the parking lots at grocery stores that go the opposite way the cars are parked, I hate those people. I shake my fist at them regularly. What are you doing? I know. Another admission of my yeah, brokenness and my foolishness. Okay, yes. Uh, just one of many. I like rules. I like structure. I like all of those things. But when we put God in a box or we stick to the rules, God has no space to work because we've excluded all the stuff that's outside of the box. We've excluded everything that can't fit in our box. And God doesn't have space to work in our hearts and in our minds. And the truly remarkable thing about that passage and maybe you heard it, maybe you missed it. If you heard it, uh, maybe you've heard it so many times that you didn't really think much about it. But after uh, Philip's remark, Jesus says, you all are going to do way incredibly greater things than I ever did. Whoa. Really? Like, is that even possible? Well, okay, let's think about what he's trying to say there. Are you going to walk on water? Are you going to raise the dead? Are you going to heal the blind, make the lame to walk? Are you going to do those things? Are you going to die on a cross for the salvation of all of creation? Well, no, it's not quantitatively or qualitatively that Jesus was speaking, but quantitatively, yes. At the time of Jesus' death, there was less than a couple hundred of people following him would have identified themselves as followers of Jesus. Even some four or five, six decades later, there was still only thousands of people that would have called themselves followers of Christ. Today we have billions. If it weren't for those disciples, and Jesus, I believe, was training them to think outside the box, to not put God in the box, to let God be God and allow God to lead them to trust in Jesus and the Father's will 
and to just be people that loved God and loved other people. The very simple commands that Jesus gave us basically boiled it down to those two things. Love God, love others. You figure it out. Do those things and you will do greater than I could have ever done. And if it weren't for them, if they would just went, this is just too confusing and too hard and I don't understand it. Give me some rules. Give me some instructions. And it would have died. Jesus would have just been a dude. He would have just been a guy. A myth. Maybe someone that people wrote about. Instead, 2,000 years later, he is the way, the truth, and the life. He is the way to salvation. He is the absolute truth, and he is the life in relationship with God. He made possible for us that intimate relationship with God that we could not accomplish ourselves. And the spirit of God that he gave us, in two chapters after this, in chapter 16, Jesus speaks about that. The spirit that dwells in us, Christ living in us, has allowed his message and the power of his life and death to live on, and it will continue to live on through us. That's unbelievable, and it's impossible, and it's beyond understanding. And that's the way that God meant it to be. To not overthink things. To not get stuck in our ways or in our rules or to place God in a box because it makes it more comfortable for us. He doesn't want us to be comfortable. I mean, it's okay every once in a while to put on those comfy shoes or maybe a sweater that you've had for a couple decades longer than you should have. But the work happens when we step out, when we do things that we don't think were possible, were possible for us, when we don't see the end game of it, or what's in it for us. Because also at the end of that passage was giving glory to God. The end of the Peter, the passage from 1 Peter, is to give glory to God. That's the purpose of all of it. Because it's not about us. Though we do complicate things and want to make it about us. To live in the I don't know of our faith. Because God doesn't ask us to know. He doesn't demand of us to know, to figure things out. He's got the big stuff. We need to know God loves us. Infinitely more than we can ever, ever imagine. God loves this world. Infinitely more than we could ever possibly imagine. God loves every human being on this earth now who has ever walked this earth or who will ever walk this earth without exception, period. And that he was God. Jesus was God. And that his love for us was so immense that he was willing to die not to get rid of sin, but to take away from us the consequences of our sin and to make possible for us this relationship with him and the Father and the Holy Spirit that is permanent, that cannot be taken away. Outside of that, the rest of it can be, eh, I don't really know. So if you ask me those hard questions and I say, I don't know, that's not because I haven't thought of it. I'll try my best. I do that all the time. And, and if I go into a very lengthy explanation, it's really because I don't know. And I'm just, <laughs> I'm just trying to get to a place where I can say something. But, but I do try to make things more simple. I do try to simplify things. I'm a simple person. And it's okay to be, I don't know. Because you do believe. You do trust in the things that matter and that are important. And because of that, the gospel continues to spread. Praise God for that. Individually, with each of us, even if you don't think it happens, it does. And collectively, as a congregation, it's amplified through us. 
We are doing greater things than Jesus did, not qualitatively, but quantitatively. And that's something that I think we can all celebrate and something that we need to be reminded of, that we matter, that we're not just ordinary people, that we are the extraordinary witnesses and disciples, those who follow the one who is the way, the truth, and the life.